entitled Transnational Islam One. It is uh, one of three sessions on transnational Islam. So, three distinguished candidates <coughs> will present papers in this session. Uh, Professor Edith Bak at Tel Aviv University, who will present a paper entitled Sufis from West Africa in Jerusalem, Dynamic of Religious Exchange During Colonial Time. The second speaker, Dr. Rea Rahman, will present a paper entitled Racializing the Good Muslim, the White Nest of Soft Power and Black Muslim Activists in South Africa. She's affiliated with Brooklyn College. The third, Professor Steve Howard from Ohio University will present a paper entitled On the Path of the Prophet in Unsettled Times, Sudan Republican Brotherhood Looks Abroad. So I will first give the floor to uh, Professor Edith Bach. Professor, you. you have the floor. Thank you. I will stand if it's OK. So um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Kahneman. Thank you all for inviting me from a far away. Um, and I will talk about today about uh, Sufis uh, uh, from West Africa and Jerusalem, dynamic of religious exchange during colonial time. Just want to see if it's work. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Um, okay. Hajj pilgrimage is not new in the history of West African Muslims. Trans-Saharan camel caravan from West Africa to Mecca were known since the penetration of Islam into West Africa via the Saharan trade route, along which they carried both commercial goods and human idea, such as the importance of the Hajj to the Muslim believer. The Hajj from West Africa reached its peak with the spectacular caravans uh, of the ruler of the region, states, and empire during the 14th and 15th century. Those Hajj caravans, um, continue to appear even with the decline of the Saharan trade in the 16th century. And here, of course, you see the well-known uh, Hajj caravan of uh, uh, the Imperial uh, Mansa Musa. And this is the picture of the trade route from West Africa uh, via Sudan route to uh, Mecca and Medina. Uh, those Hajj caravans continue to appear even with the decline of the Saharan trade in the 16th century, following the rise of the European coastal trade and the result resulting decline of the medieval states and empire. Pilgrim used the pilgrimage highway known as the Sudan route, which ran from the city of Katsina and Kano uh, into Egypt, so always across the Nile. Along the continental Hajj routes, many towns developed as commercial centers and gathering spots for the pilgrimage. In many uh, cases, the journey itself involved financial and, dif and physical difficulties. Uh, some of the West African pilgrims tended to settle along this route, either in the way to Arabia or in the way back, thereby creating their own community and villages in the places like present-day Sudan. Regarding the descendant of the West African pilgrim who still reside in this community, Yamba uh, wrote, noted that they tend to be a fundamentalist by conviction who regard uh, trudging eastward along desert route with the great hardship, uh, such journey and tile. Uh, as the only proper way to performing the Hajj. He claimed that um, although some pilgrims uh, were third, fourth, or even fifth uh, generation immigrant in some of these places along the route, they still regard themselves as being in transit. Uh, and not only do they define themselves as being in the way uh, to the outside observer, they live and act as they are still uh, were in the way. Uh, in this sense, one might wonder if the feeling of temporariness experienced by either individual or community created the demand for a sphere of, of sainthood uh, that would provide a sense of familiarity and control in the in environment of rapid change and uncertain, un uncertainty. I examine this question below in relation to the community of West African Muslims settled in Jerusalem during the colonial period. 
Uh, as for Jerusalem uh, in the Hajj circuit, uh, it was during the Umayyad period also uh, 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 that Jerusalem established as the third holy city of Islam after Mecca and Medina uh, by building uh, the, ro the Dome of the Rock. Since then, Jerusalem has been an important shrine and send center of pilgrimage for all true religion community attached to the Abrahamic heritage. It is unclear when um, a West African Muslim first arrived in significant number in Jerusalem. According to uh, Bourguion, uh, there is evidence that the two word ribat uh, were uh, within Jerusalem were given to West African probably during the Mamluk period, around the 13th century. During this period, the Jerusalem Waqf uh, was also bestowed upon the West African settled in Jerusalem and took on the historic role of the guardian of the mask, of Al-Aqsa mask. During the British mandate period in Palestine, particularly in the 1930s, group of Chadian, Senegalese, Sudanese, and Nigerian made their way to Jerusalem as part of the extended uh, pilgrimage uh, circuit, uh, joining Mecca and Medina uh, as part of this uh, circuit. This paper examining the role of the Hajj for those West African Muslim who settled in Jerusalem in the same period, it will attempt to recount their story from the perspective of the way that active Sufi networks shaped their interaction with the surrounding in both their Hajj voyage to Jerusalem and the set settlement in Jerusalem uh, of the Mandat. Actually, I will focus here in the community in Jerusalem because I don't have the time to to talk about uh, the voyage itself, but a few words about uh, what happened during, to the Hajj during the, in, uh, from West Africa during the colonial period. Uh, so the Hajj, though the Hajj pilgrimage was not, uh, dates back earlier in the history of West African Muslims, the colonial era, era transformed its pattern, scope, and intensity, as well as its impact upon uh, the mobilization of people and idea. Improvement in I infrastructure, the av uh, availability of cheap mechanical mass transport, and government planning of the Hajj provided new opportunity and creating shifting sphere spheres of influence. The Sufi Tariqa acted as a cross-community network, providing the basis for the creation of new community of West African along this route, and enabling pilgrim to establish contacts with other Muslim community and to spread their message further. Uh, here you see a few examples of the infrastructural improvement. Uh, it was uh, mostly uh, 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 those related to steam engine uh, that enable people to perform the Hajj more comfortably, uh, the creation of railroad networks and the improved, improved, improvement of maritime uh, transfer uh, combined with geographical change, such as the opening of the Suez Canal. Um, uh, undertaking the voyage by steamship and later on by air, by, uh, you can see here the, uh, 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 the air companies, um, also facilitated the spread of new ideas in new community through the Hajj. Notably, the Hajj brought pilgrims not only to Mecca, the spatial ne network of steam transport into which the pilgrimage was integrated, exposed them to the world beyond the old memory spaces of the pre-industrial Dar el-Islam. Uh, I like also uh, to show you something that I found in the Durham archive. Uh, this is uh, from the Sudan station uh, in uh, Khartoum, I think, about, uh, of uh, a list of uh, pilgrims from West Africa uh, who um, uh, travel via Sudan. And it also become more uh, documented, uh, the numbers and the people who participated, uh, etc. But now I want to talk, <laughs> to focus my talk uh, on the a Muslim African community in Jerusalem, so I skipped the way. 
and the focus in, in the geographical area of the old city of Jerusalem. Sorry for being a little bit uh, <laughs> cold. Uh, and the, the mandate period, uh, it was the, from, the 1970, from 1917 to 1948. But especially I will talk about the 1930s. Uh, during the Ottoman period, Jerusalem became much more accessible both to tourists and pilgrims. The Jaffa Jerusalem Railway, inaugurated in, in uh, 1892, facilitated the transport between the port of Jaffa and mountainous Jerusalem, and the number of uh, pilgrims was uh, soaring at the beginning of the 20th century. Most of the pilgrims, however, were European Christian, uh, mostly from Russia, other from Italy, France, and other European nations. In spite of the fact that many of the pilgrims were from poor socioeconomic background, some of them left travel documents such as uh, diaries, uh, uh, documented their pilgrim voyage to Jerusalem. Other data regarding the pilgrim uh, numbers, uh, conduct, etc., could be retrieved from the European consulate record, many of them established during this period of the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Much less documented was the pilgrim of Muslim to Jerusalem during that period, partly because of the fact that Jerusalem was not the main destination of the Hajj circuit, uh, and much more attention was given to the pilgrim uh, to the Hijaz, both by the Ottoman uh, and later by the European powers. Lack of documentation is particularly relevant to the arrival of West African pilgrims to Jerusalem during this period, uh, as mentioned by Yasser Kos, and I will uh, refer to the name Yasser Kos later on. I just want to uh, quote something from his article. The issue of settlement raises many questions about when and how this different West African community came to settle in Jerusalem, and also vis-a-vis -vis the relation with the local Arab community. Uh, while Sijlat el Mahkimat el Kaira, the records of the Islamic Waqf uh, archive tend to emphasize the lack of strong relationship, relationship between the Black African Muslim community and the Jerusalem West African community. I take uh, the challenge to recount the story uh, for the perspective uh, of active network and ongoing ethnic clustering. According to the Waqf records, the West African Muslim group was estimated in 74 persons in, in, uh, in 1992, and in 1948, the end of the mandate period, it was estimated by 3,000. Indeed, it was during the British mandate period, particularly in the 1930s, that the group of Chadian, Senegalese, and Nigerian, and others made their way to Jerusalem. As mentioned above, many of them arrived in a search of new economic and vocational opportunities, in particular in the railways and other infrastructure works. Yet, for some of them, arrival was also part of an extended pilgrimage to Islam holy sites that included Mecca and Medina as part of the Sahad circuit. Uh, some of them returned to their homelands and told their families and friends of the wonder they beheld and experienced in the only city. Uh, these marvelous accounts kindled the, in the hearts of many of the co religious prevent yearning to visit the marvelous city and at the same time to make the Hajj. One example was the case of uh, Elhad Jade, community Mukhtar. He was born in, a gem, in Jamna, uh, today Chad, and uh, wandered through his childhood to different locations in West Africa, where he acquired both an Islamic education and knowledge uh, of English uh, and French. His Hajj route uh, took him across the Sudan, Ethiopia, and Yemen, as he explained in the interview. Okay. Uh, from Yemen, we walked to Mecca. We arrived to Mecca. After performing the Hajj, we went to Medina. After that, we set off for Jerusalem. Uh, we spent two days traveling on water before uh, setting off again a foot. First, we walked to jo Jordan, and after we arrived here in Palestine, we settled here in Jerusalem. There were already people uh, here from Sudan and from Nigeria, and this is uh, with whom we stayed uh, in this world. Uh, there were lots of Hausa too, who came uh, here uh, as a kind of pilgrimage. Our brother here gave us a place to live. 
During that period, most members of the West African community settled in the area that called the African Quarter. Uh, just a second. No, this one. Just a second. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, we call also Chayal uh, Jailia uh, El Ifriqiya. This compound was compromised of two ribat, ribat El Basri and ribat El Mansuri. Uh, that were constructed during the Mamluk area. And here we have just picture of the Mamluk building in uh, uh, Jerusalem. It's not, uh, it's not in the African quarter. You can see there, the, I don't know if you see, but it's an uh, um, Armenian uh, uh, church over there. But uh, there are still many Mamluk buildings uh, from the Mamluk period in Jerusalem. This is just two examples that I took from there. Um, uh, during the Mamluk area, uh, they, it was turned into jail, into prison, uh, sorry, during the late Ottoman period. And it was during the uh, beginning of the Mandash, uh, British Mandate period that this compound was given to West African Muslim community, probably from the proximity to Aqsa Mosque compound, where they, many of them serve as guards. Yet, uh, in spite of the fact that many of these African newcomers married local Palestinian and assimilated in many aspects with the general en environment of the old city of Jerusalem, they still suffered from negative stereotype, as can be applied by the term Abid. And if, if you ask in the old city of Jerusalem, uh, how, get I, uh, how do I get to the African quarter? They say, ah, Habs el Abid, <laughs> the jail of the... Slaves, so they still suffer for prejudices, in, in spite of the fact that they are uh, most of them, most of these men married local Palestinian. Uh, yet, beside their identification with uh, vis the other Muslims uh, in mandatory Jerusalem, one has to wonder how their communal identity was composed. Even the definition of West African that were arriving during the Hajj circuit is quite controversial. How, for example, would one define the arrival to Jerusalem of people from West Africa who had settled for many generations in Sudan? Are they Sudanese? Are they uh, other? Uh, moreover, the community itself is heterogeneous in its composition. Not only the they originate in different regions of West Africa, but they also divide along uh, at least eight ethnic groups. Auza, uh, Fulani, Kanuri, Zarawa, Salamat, Barku, Kanambu, and Bulula. They were also speaking different, different languages. Some of them belong to different uh, family of languages even. They also divided across their, um, their, uh, the way they related to their Arabic heritage. Some of the tribes, such as the uh, Bulala and the Salamat, uh, consider themselves as uh, belong more to the uh, Arab uh, uh, from, uh, Saudi, from the uh, Arabia. Considering this factor, one could wonder if Sufism was a common do denominator that was practiced by most of the West African Muslims that arrived to Jerusalem. Jerusalem uh, was part of the root of West African Sufi pilgrim even before the British Mandate period. One of the cu curious events was the visit uh, to Jerusalem of the founder of uh, the Tijani Empire, or the Tukolor Empire, El Hajj Omar Tal. Uh, as part of his mis Middle Eastern tour, uh, he spent time in Jerusalem. His reputation for piety and learning uh, were recognized. He is said to have led the prayer of the Dome of the Rock, cured the son of the Ottoman Sultan uh, for madness in Sir Syria, and astonished scholars in Cairo of by his vast uh, knowledge. Another case was the Tijani propagandist uh, that was visiting uh, uh, from Algeria. His name was Muhammad bin Abdul Malik Al Alami, who undertook to make the order known in the Egyptian Sudan, Syria, and Palestine during the beginning of the 20th century, and even established uh, Tijania, Zawiya Tijania uh, in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, this reference to early visits of Sufi uh, to Jerusalem was particularly uh, important in the broader context of the Jerusalem rule in the Hajj during the British Mandate uh, period. 
now I want to, uh, this is the uh, quarter uh, surrounding the area of Soren, the, the Arab, uh, the African quarter. Uh, see uh, Tariq El Wad, uh, the, the Wadi uh, um, uh, street and the Souk El uh, Atarin. And here I like these pictures particularly. You see it's a mountain of spices and a small model of uh, <laughs> Laksa uh, mask uh, on the top. So uh, this is a picture that I took there. And, uh, this is a picture from the West African uh, compound itself. This is the compound. It's very, very small. Um, today, most of them don't live there. They live in Gaza, Jericho, and other places, and just a small minority left there. Uh, and I would like to talk about uh, Muhammad uh, Kors and his nephew, Yasser Kors. And Yasser Kors was the, one of the young leaders of the community that I met there and uh, interview him and start actually my uh, research uh, while meeting him. Uh, and he, to he, he, he told me about his uncle, uh, Muhammad Kors, and uh, about himself. Uh, they, he was born in Chad uh, and performed the Hajj at the age of uh, uh, 16 or 17 in the young age, uh, he became one of the central uh, religious uh, figure in the community and was responsible, for example, for teaching the community youngsters the seven proper way to learn the Quran. Moreover, through his Sufi affiliation, he extended the ties of the West African community to other Muslim community in Jerusalem, such as those of immigrants from the Maghreb and Afghanistan. More interestingly, he was awarded with his own Hadra, at Zawiya Afrania. And Zawiya Afrania, it's very uh, old and uh, important Zawiya in Jerusalem, of Afghan people, of course, uh, and um, consider a lively place of gathering and spiritual practice uh, in Jerusalem. An uh, invitation of uh, Muhammad Kors uh, to perform one of the main ritual was quite an honor. The invitation, he, he led the zikr there. The invitation of an African sheikh to undertake the position provided an example of how Sufi affiliation play an important role in establishing the West African community in Jerusalem and extended its social religious connection uh, to other Muslim community there. Another course uh, that Yasser uh, course mentioned, his nephew, uh, was the visit uh, uh, to Jerusalem of the German emperor, uh, William uh, II, with his wife, Augusta Victoria. The tour was intended to reveal the impressive church hospital complex and to build the southern side of the Mount Scopus beside the Mount of the Olives. Yasser Kors noted to me that uh, West African that were serving as the guardian of the Alaksa Museum were imprisoned during uh, this visit uh, in, uh, because they, they were feared that they will, uh, won't allow the, this notable to enter the museum because according to the Tijani faith, uh, the presence of non-Muslim uh, could contaminate the sacred place. Um, so this is uh, another uh, story uh, regarding the, the role of uh, Sufi identity in the uh, life of uh, Muslim community life in Jerusalem of the Af West African. Uh, so uh, to conclude. Uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, Hajj route facilitated the mobilization of religious ideas, serving as powerful vehicle in the spread of Islamic ideas and practice, whether the context was orthodox, popular, or some kind of combination between them. Through this route, the Tariqa played a key role in stressing ties with the followers from other places, in establishing new community, and in further spreading the call of the Tariqa uh, into other community. I, I usually deal with the Tijaniya uh, Tariqa, uh, but other two. My initial conclusion regarding the community of West African in, um, Muslim in Jerusalem support this assumption. Most of them arrived there as a result of the conjunction of new travel opportunity in a colonial period combined with the religious aspiration. The Sufi affiliation served as an important vehicle both in facilitating the pilgrimage itself and establishing their community network in Jerusalem. The prism of interaction between the Hajj and Sufism, including issues such as the dynamic between Orthodox and non 
Orthodox current of Islam, unable us to undertake a less dichotomic approach toward Islam, uh, countering the scholarly trend of emphasizing Islam, Puritan, and Orthodox characterized as an example of the, uh, as, at the expense of its more pluralistic and inclusive view. Further research could ex examine, for example, pan-Islamic idea on the Muslim uh, on Muslim, the effect of pan-Islamic idea on Muslim in Jerusalem during the colonial period when it became an important factor in pan-Islamic thought uh, I'm, I'm at the end. And look and the call of some tariqas could be considered radical uh, with context that could be classified as pan-African, pan-Islamic or anti-colonial. Uh, if the, uh, this assumption proved correct, uh, it will refute a literature literature common classification of Sufism as local anti-reformist branch of Islam. And I would like to uh, just to show in the end, uh, this is the, the picture of Yasser Kos. And after I interviewed him, him I wrote uh, this uh, paper, this article, uh, from West Africa to Mecca and Jerusalem, the Tijaniya and the Hadrut. Later on, he wrote this paper, the West African community in Jerusalem, processes of settlement and local integration, quoting my, and now I'm writing a new article, uh, going to be published soon, and uh, I'm quoting him. So this is the dynamic of uh, um, uh, knowledge exchange during the modern area. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, I would like to thank you and uh, show you some uh, picture that I took in uh, Jerusalem. It's uh, I'm going to comment on it. Uh, I took this picture in Jerusalem, and we are next week. It's going to be the new, uh, 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 the new year, the new Jewish year, and we use this as one of the symbol of uh, blessing for the new year. So I want to bless you in happy new year, and thank you. <laughs> yeah. <Rosh Hashanah. laughs> thank you very much for a very fascinating uh, talk. Uh, or lecture, <laughs> you know, it was last year when Deji came back from Brazil and met you that he told me about this community that you were studying and I knew nothing about it and I was so much interested in pilgrimage. So, I also knew nothing <laughs> about it until I traveled there and accidentally found yeah. out about it. <laughs> okay, now the second speaker is uh, Dr. Ria Rahman from Brooklyn College who will present a paper entitled Racializing the Good Muslim. Ria, you have the floor. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for the invitation, conference organizers. Um, so, founded in Birmingham, England in 1984 by Egyptian immigrant Dr. Hani al Banna, Islamic Relief is today the world's largest and most recognized Western based Islamic NGO in the world. In this paper, I examine Islamic Relief's practices surrounding HIV and AIDS to uncover the racial projects that underpin differing responses to the epidemic. Um, counterposing a politics surrounding the production and eventual removal of an HIV official policy, um, I counter that with a more community-oriented grassroots approach that I saw advocated by certain members of the organization's employees in Johannesburg. I consider competing racial projects of Muslim white adjacency versus black Muslim liberation. And I'll explain what I mean by both of those. Um, I claim that anti-Muslim racism in the global north conditions soft power, ethical, and political constraints that I frame as a form of white adjacency. Ultimately, for a Western-based Islamic development and humanitarian NGO to be able to operate, to function, and to acquire funds from Western-based um, funding institutions, it requires the NGO to adopt particular political, ethical, and Islamic orientations. Um, I examine the underlying racial project, which constitutes the making of the moderate Muslim in the West. As opposed to this more official policy orientation towards HIV and AIDS, I consider grassroots politics of certain black Muslim Islamic Relief staff members in Johannesburg. Um, whereas most staff members of Islamic Relief in South Africa reflect the broader racial dem demographics of South African Muslims as either Cape Malay or Indian, I foreground the significance of this grassroots approach uh, that was advocated, organized, and executed by the few black Muslims who were in management positions in the organization in Johannesburg. Um, significantly, whereas within South Africa and abroad, the Muslim community is thought of as predominantly Cape Malay or Indian, 
um, the formation of such groups such as the Gauteng Shura Muslim Council and the organization of the first black South African Muslim conference held in April of this year are indicative of a burgeoning self-identified black Muslim, uh, black South African Muslim community and movement. Um, I frame the grassroots approach as part of a racial project consolidating a black South African Muslim identity as distinct from what may be considered a more adjacent Indian South African identity. Um, ultimately, while I argue that anti-Muslim racism in the global north creates conditions, and I want to kind of think about are they conditions or necessity or what ability do Muslims have to act as political agents, um, so the conditions this kind of white adjacency, I show the ways that this white adjacency is, or I claim that it's complicit in a kind of anti-blackness um, and that black Muslims in South Africa, amongst other places in the organization, are organizing against it. Um, so in uh, HIV policy of white adjacency, in 2006, the British Development for the British Department for International Development (DFID) expanded its funding to include eight new development organizations, and amongst them was the NGO Islamic <coughs> Relief. Um, it marks the beginning of a long-term relationship with the British government's International Development Fund um, with with Islamic Relief, and one of the objectives of this initial funding was um, asked Islamic Relief to contribute an Islamic perspective to policy and research on a range of humanitarian and development issues with specific focus on HIV and AIDS, reproductive health, debt and finance, and gender justice. A year later, DFID partnered with a newly instituted consortium of UK-based organizations linking faith and international HIV and AIDS work. The Faith Working Group, uh, is an initiative that understands the epidemic as one caused by risky, i.e. immoral, behavior. In assuming the gender inequality, sexual, uh, deviant sexuality, and a lack of moral foundation are the primary driver, drivers of the ep epidemic, faith-based approaches to HIV and AIDS focus primarily on homosexuality, the permissibility of condom use, and social stigma towards those affected by HIV and AIDS. An important aspect of such initiatives is that potential solutions are framed in terms of behavior or culture change. Um, a work faith and group report explains that, quote, faith is closely connected with all aspects of HIV and AIDS. It often sets the underlying values around gender and sex that influence people's behavior and how people respond to those living with HIV. Given the assumptions in the Western development sector of the overlap between religion and culture in the developing world, this working group sought to bring about culture behavior change by, quote, influencing religious organizations, leaders, and development partners um, in the development of a UK-based international HIV and AIDS strategy. So this partnership falls within DFID's expanding work with religious-based NGOs in promoting international development solutions based on culture change. Um, while initiatives uh, such as this group also did work with Christian NGOs, I want to claim that given the explicitly racist targeting of British Muslims in a UK <coughs> global war on terror, I frame this partnership between DFID and Islamic Relief as part of British soft diplomacy strategies to construct a middle ground or moderate Muslim identity. Significantly, I highlight the racial element of this moderate Muslim identity as an engagement with whiteness. Such initiatives countering violent extremism that specifically target Muslims are contextualized here genealogically as a part of a racist civilizing mission towards Islam and Muslims. In a personal interview in Johannesburg in 2013 with the South African Islamic scholar Faridi Sak, he suggests that Western funding plans such as the Faith Working Group assume that if Muslims simply gave, quote, women a bit more right and just chill out on sexuality and make more space for condoms, everything will be okay. End quote. The moderate Muslim is promoted to counter Muslims' presumed backward positions on gender and sexuality. But significantly, I situate this funding scheme in the sense that it's a proposed initiative to reformulate or maybe reform what it means to be a good Muslim in the context of British state-sponsored counterterrorism initiatives such as the Prevent Strategy. So uh, introduced in 2003 by the new Labour government of Tony Blair and made compulsory for the public sector in 2015, the prevent strategy is, is the winning hearts and minds element of the British government's counterterrorism strategy that proposes to de-radicalize British Muslims 
And as scholars have pointed out, one of the particularities of anti-Muslim racism is the ways that it uh, um, targets what is assumed to be pious Muslim behavior. For example, the choice not to drink alcohol in, in social settings or, or at all as signs of Islamic radicalism and therefore a precursor to terrorism. Um, but not, and not only does the development sector propose that the cure to HIV and AIDS rests in getting Muslims to chill out on sexuality, but the British state is invested in the promotion of a good, liberal, moderate Muslim who will support, or at the very least, not oppose Western imperialist projects in the so-called Muslim world. Um, hence, the effort to shape Muslim behavior by Western powers, such as the British government, I'm claiming cannot be considered uh, apart from a promotion of racialized Western imperial projects. While the racism of initiatives such as PREVENT, which operates on the presumption that all Muslims are essentially radicalized and therefore need to be de-radicalized through programs such as PREVENT, um, while this has recently come to be acknowledged in scholarship, I suggest that we also understand initiatives such as DFID's faith working group as also premised on the racist assumptions regarding the need to de-radicalize Muslims. And further, the idea that Muslims need to de-radicalize is not only promoted by non-Muslims, but rather is also internalized and taken up by Muslims themselves. Um, and I suggest that for Islamic Relief to succeed, as it does as one of the world's largest and recognized Western-based NGOs, it also um, has to take up particular positions within humanitarian politics or ethics that it's aligned within the ideal ideological logics of global white supremacy. Thus, in an effort to counter the racist assumptions promoted by a Western-based global war on terror that targets predominantly, but certainly not exclusive, what I'm calling brown Muslims, referring to Arab and South Asians, I show the ways that the white adjacency of Islamic relief on an institutional level is complicit in a global anti-blackness that posits an apolitical and ahistorical relation to Africa in need of white adjacent saving. When it comes to Islamic Relief's work on HIV and AIDS on a global level, but in particular in South Africa, how might we understand the racial logic <coughs> that call forth a preference for behavior model change as opposed to ones that address, which I claim and am situating with what I'm calling a, a black Muslim lib liberatory model, ones that address chronic structural issues such as poverty, social dislocation, and inequitable access to health care. So the aforementioned uh, DFID grant with Islamic Relief specified 130,000 pounds to be used to organize an international consultation on HIV and AIDS. And this took place in 2007 in Johannesburg. In an effort to change hearts and minds, conference planners sought to bring together who were not typically thought to be in conversation with each other, namely Islamic scholars, aid workers, and people living with HIV and AIDS. Activities for the conference were planned around intimate, small-scale workshops in which participant, participants could discuss controversial issues through the examination of specific case studies. The goal was to culti cultivate a quote in an Islamically acceptable and effective approach to global HIV and AIDS, to the global HIV and AIDS pandemic. According to one um, conference leaflet, Organizers anticipated that the answers to the questions posed in these workshops would form policy recommendations to governments, Muslim leaders, and organizations working in the field of HIV and AIDS. Um, one of the sample questions included in one of these leaflets um, said, quote, in Islam, orphans and other vulnerable groups are clearly defined. Mm -hmm. Children whose parents are alive but incapacitated by AIDS are not part of conventional definitions. In view of the HIV pandemic, should these definitions be reviewed and elaborated? If so, what should the new definitions look like?" End quote. Questions such as this brought, uh, sought to bring the level of engagement down from ideological ab abstractions to pragmatic solutions for issues that, that directly affected HIV-affected communities. In the sense that the official, is, um, the official policy that was one of the outcomes from the conference, um, was itself the outcome of a new British government international development funding initiative. The fact that it focuses on behavior change, um, I situate the policy at an institutional level within a racial project of white adjacency. Um, and now I want to counter that with, with ways that I saw people organizing in South Africa. So after having to cur curtail my research in Mali after a military coup in Bamako in March of 2012, and before moving my research field site to South Africa, I spent the interim in Amsterdam. And while there, I contacted the Islamic Relief Office in the Netherlands um, to gain another perspective on Islamic Relief's fundraising partners in Europe. 
um, I met there uh, the manager of the or the program manager, who um, along in addition to managing the Islamic Relief Netherlands programs, the programs that they funded, particularly in Africa, she also managed um, the organization's participation in a working group at well, at an institute called the Religion and Development Knowledge Center. Like the initiatives of DFID discussed earlier, the Religion and Development Knowledge Center is a Dutch government-funded initiative de dedicated to thinking through social development issues through the lens of religion. So here, Islamic Relief's contribution was to host one conference a year. And given that there was a new scholar who was working on gender, religion, and HIV, and that I was going to soon go to South Africa, this Dutch um, Islamic Relief aid worker decided to focus that year's conference on HIV and AIDS. Um, and so I decided to help her in the organization of this conference. Um, and she also, in order to gain a better perspective of what Islamic Relief was actually doing around HIV and AIDS, she came with me to, or she visited me in South Africa so that we could get a more kind of on the ground perspective of uh, <coughs> Islamic Relief's work around that. So one of the first things we did was interview all the different employees in the Johannesburg office on what Islamic Relief actually did around HIV and AIDS. And one of the things we discovered is that what Islamic Relief does in relation to HIV and AIDS seem to differ based on the person that we spoke to. Um, so one of the first people we, we talked to and who I want to focus on here was named Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr um, was originally from Kimberley, Kosa, and he reverted to Islam as a teenager. Um, he was hired by Islamic Relief as an HIV and AIDS and gender-based violence program officer, providing trainings and development, mobilizing and networking, um, providing trainings in prisons for predominantly Muslim inmates, for imams, for Muslim and non-Muslim religious leaders, and for gender-based groups, both for a women's empowerment group and a men's gender justice organization. Um, he tells us that this is why he was initially hired, but now he feels blocked. There was a change in management at the time, and he was told to stop networking, he said, because, quote, it, it brings no fruits. To which Abu Bakr responds, so what type of fruits are you talking about? Is, is, that what you want, um, is it that you want money and then you can say that something does benefit? He says, does it mean that IR's purpose, Islamic Relief's purpose, is to bring in money? Um, I tell him that some other staff had told me uh, that the previous country director was spending more income that was actually coming into the organization, so maybe that was why this new director was focusing so much on fundraising. And Abu Bakr push back, push, pushes back against us this as well, and he explains that social networks and connections are more important than raising funds. And this is a longer quote from him. He says, let me tell you something about programs, especially HIV and AIDS. If you want to save cost, you partner with people. For example, we want AIDS workshops targeting religious leaders, Muslim and non-Muslims. So we look at who else is doing the same thing. We create partnerships with them, and we create our own, plan, uh, we, our own plan. To say we all want to achieve this goal, um, we could do capacity training, um, skills assessment, needs assessment. Um, we then tap into what we have and what we can get. Because nowadays, to avoid duplication, you need to partner with people." End quote. Um, he believes the Muslim community is failing in its moral obligation by not, being more, by not more proactively responding to the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Quote, he says, I mean, people are dying and you're still looking. He says, you are guilty as charged. End quote. At the time of our interview, Abu Bakr was doing donor care, um, which basically meant he was making cold calls to individuals and institutions trying to look for funds. Um, needless to say, coming from the dynamicism and passion that he had for the kind of work he was doing, making phone calls to fundraise, um, didn't keep him occupied, and he left Islamic Relief a few months after our interview. Um, though Abu Bakr felt that Islamic Relief worldwide approving a global strategy would help, he also told us an interesting anecdote about his previous job where he worked um, at an institution called the Muslim AIDS Project. Um, it was an affiliation of the Jamiat Ulama, the Islamic ruling body in Johannesburg, um, which promoted abstinence and being faithful. And I mentioned to Abu Bakr that this stance seems to not be aligned with the kind of much more proactive ways that he was, the kinds of trainings that he was doing and um, discourse that he was initiating, um, to, which, to which he then says that um, when one goes to a community with the intention of changing others, he says, the other ones are the ones who change you. He says, quote, they bring reality to you. Situations bring reality to you. Your experiences also educate you or inform you. Um, but whatever position you're bringing is not relevant. You have to learn from the people uh, and from what they're doing, end quote. 
He had no problem with the discrepancy um, between um, the Muslim AIDS program's official stance, promoting abstinence and faith, and the honest kind of conversations he was telling us that he was actually having in the field. Um, when I asked whether the board at the Muslim AIDS Project would be upset that he wasn't promoting abstinence um, in the field, he replied that, quote, I would write what they wanted, but I would do what I just told you. Um, he explains that MAP's ABC strategy, abstinence, be faithful, and only then promote condoms, could maybe work for primary students, he said, but not secondary students. He says, you can never say that in the townships. Try it. Go to a township in Soweto and say you must abstain. He said, I tried it. I went there. And when I spoke about abstinence, the student looked at me and he said, he asked me a very funny question saying, you want to deny from us what you've had already? And, and I think this, this line about sexuality, and, and this is something that I also see kept coming up again. So I returned, well, I'll get to that. I, I returned recently this summer, and this was another thing that a lot of black South African Muslims mentioned to me is, is um, an inability for other communities to kind of understand culturally um, where black South African Muslims were coming from. But before that, um, at both the Muslim AIDS Project and Islamic Relief, Abu Bakr towed an official line, you know, and then he acted in response to pragmatic community, uh, community needs on the ground. So for Abu Bakr, in part inspired by a black Islam of liberation and, you know, similar to other things people are saying, citing to me the relevance of black, uh, black Muslim Americans such as Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad, um, his, his, he tells me that his Islamic values push him to do and to not talk. Um, for Abu Bakr, doing meant going into communities, being open to being changed, and formed by the realities faced by his <coughs> community, and giving back what he could. It entailed using his charm and enthusiasm to influence, in particular for him, black uh, Muslim young men. Um, and he was one of, and among most of the staff that I met in Johannesburg, he was the most engaged in the community. Um, and since, the, since that trip in 2013, I went this summer. Um, more black South African Muslims have begun to organize collectively as a black Muslim community with distinct cultural, ethical, practical, and therefore distinct religious concerns from those of an Indian or Cape Malay background. For black South African Muslims I spoke to, um, they described similar issues. So one imam in a township in Johannesburg explained to me that there were three sources of alienation faced by black South African Muslims. He says, on the one hand, from one's own family, where most black South Africans come from an atheist or Christian background. So he says, when one reverts to Islam, one is considered an outsider in their own family. Um, secondly, from the immediate community. So beyond the family, again, legacies of apartheid mean that 25 years of democracy, m many South Africans live in racially segregated communities. So when black South African Muslims revert to Islam, some adopt Arabic or Indian styles of clothing to signify their Muslim identity. Um, many then face discrimination from peers. He says he himself had often been asked, why are you dressed like an Arab or an Indian? Um, and, and today, in particular, with increasing violence towards foreigners, black South African Muslims face accusations that in becoming Muslim, they've sided with either the Indians, Malay, or in most cases, when people mention um, black Muslims in South Africa, people assume that you're referring to um, Muslims from throughout the continent that are in South Africa's so-called foreigners. And therefore, the idea of becoming Muslim, there was this imam was saying to me, he then gets read as not as authentically black South African. Um, and the third challenge is then the racism black Muslims face from within the South African Muslim community. Um, as on this second trip, as one um, black Muslim employee of Islamic Relief explained to me, um, he only experienced inter, though he, he only experienced interpersonal racism after he converted to Islam. Um, at, when after performing Salat in a masjid, an Indian Muslim refuses to shake his hand. Um, when I later asked him how he handles working in a predominantly Indian Muslim NGO, because most of the staff members of Islamic Relief in Johannesburg were Indian Muslim, um, given these descriptions he had given me of racist experiences that not just him, but many black South African Muslims I spoke to, um, you know, I said, how do, you, how do you then handle that? And he says, on the one hand, calling Indian Muslims racist, he said, it's an, e it's an easy target. It's obvious. He says, but we also have to understand the structure behind those behaviors. He said, this Indian Muslim is acting in accordance with the beliefs and practices he grew up with. He says, it's, um, you know, he didn't think it was this interpersonal racism was OK. In fact, he, he had pulled his own daughter from an Indian Muslim school in Johannesburg in an attempt to protect her from the kinds of demeaning or psychologically detrimental experiences that he faced going to um, Indian Muslim schools. 
Um, but he also says uh, when he faces a, what he feels is the condescending question as when an Indian Muslim asks him, how did you become Muslim? He says at first his response was to counterattack, but now he, he thinks that counterattacking is pointless. He says he talks now about transformation. He says South Africa has never dealt with racism at a natural at a national level, at which point I ask about the Truth and Reconcilia Reconciliation Commission, which he brushes off as a farce. He says in which perpetrators were left off completely scot-free. Um, he says change must be strategic and transformative. Um, like Abu Bakr before him, Tariq um, ha has also initiated a grassroots empowerment program, which I suggest is, is aligned uh, with as an anti-racist Jew for self strategy that refutes the subtle but no less insidious forms of white supremacy as that of the British government funding that comes with its making moderate Muslims stipulations. And to conclude, I suggest the grassroots approach, um, the grassroots approach of employees such as Tariq and Abu Bakr run counter to the white adjacencies promoted by the organization at an institutional level. Um, ultimately, in a story of what it means to do good, and maybe more specifically what it means for Muslims to do good in Africa, um, I've argued that anti-Muslim racism in the West does condition the possibilities and limitations of Islamic Relief's humanitarianism. It would seem that being accepted in the West does come with certain constraints, figuring who can and who cannot be saved, and what that saving means. So, thank you. Thank you, Rhea, for a very <clears throat> insightful presentation. Now uh, I will turn the floor over to Professor Steve Howard from Ohio University who will present a paper titled On the Path of the Prophet in Unsettled Times, Sudan's Republican, Republican Brotherhood Looks Abroad. Professor, you have the floor. <clears throat> salam alaikum. Salam. salam. The, <clears throat> the popular uprising and the dramatic political changes in Sudan over the past few months have emerged <laughs> from the <clears throat> challenges to Sudan's religious order since the 1980s and earlier. While this uprising has been ostensibly secular in nature, it should be noted that because morality or spirituality enter virtually every Sudanese space, the political activity of the last few months has been marked by a high state of consciousness as well. The protests have featured the chant, Sinia, Sinia, Dit al Haramiya, years and years against the thieves, as a moral reminder of the view from the street of the previous regime. The small but significant Republican Brotherhood, founded by Mahmoud Mohammed Taha, has been the center of those changes, particularly in pricking the nation's consciousness throughout this period of time. This period has also seen the departure of many Republican brothers and sisters from, the <clears throat> from their beloved homeland. How the Fikra Jamhuriya, the Republican ideology, has been preserved and practiced abroad is the subject of this paper, which is part of a larger project on how the members of the Republican movement had fared in the wake of the execution of their leader and spiritual guide in 1985. Sustaining the charisma of a dynamic teacher in his absence is certainly at the core of the history of all of Sudan's many Sufi sects. But in the case of Mahmoud Mamata's Republican Brotherhood, in that an esoteric personal discipline is its essential essence. Uh, the removal of adherence from the familiar surroundings of Sudan to societies like the Gulf states or the United States uh, provides tests to faith that may not have been considered. And the challenge of passing on the spiritual discipline to one's children while living abroad may be especially daunting. Mahmoud Mohammed Taha, 1909 to 1985, was trained as an engineer, the engineer during Sudan's colonial period at Gordon Memorial College, later the University of Khartoum, and became active in the Graduates Congress, the primary vehicle of Sudan's independence movement. In the 1940s, Taha jumped into the political fray himself, founding what he called the Republican Party to move towards the, replacing the British Egyptian condominium with the Republic of Sudan. The context of this move was that the two major parties at the time, the Umma party of the Mahdists and the Democratic Unionists of the Khatmiya Sufi Tariga, 
had in Taha's views non-Republican designs on post-condominium Sudan. The Mahdists intended to establish a hereditary administration with rule by the descendants of the 19th century's Mahdi, and the DUP was promoting union with Egypt. <clears throat> by 1945, it was clear that these two political party leviathans would detract the votes of their Sufi followers and crowd out any political organization. Taha set politics aside at that point in order to engage in social reform. Taha's activism continued in his hometown of Rufa on the Blue Nile when a woman was arrested by the British colonial police for circumcising her young daughter. This ancient and pre-Islamic practice had been outlawed by the British colonial authorities several years earlier. Ta led a demonstration at Friday prayers following the woman's arrest and was himself taken into custody. He spent several months in jail for that offense and upon his release took to a khalwa, a retreat in Rufa. He emerged after two years with his new understanding of divine revelation. The essence of that interpretation was to distinguish and, oper and operationalize the Quranic revelation from the Meccan phase of the prophets, of, the Muhammad, of Prophet Muhammad's prophecy from the Medinan phase, with the latter speaking specifically and exclusively to the disruptive social period of the resettlement of the Muslims in Medina, and the Meccan texts speaking to all of mankind through all of eternity. The latter texts also provided the path or ibadah of the Prophet himself. The second message of Islam, based on the Meccan revelations, became the thesis for Taha's teachings, and through the 1950s to the 70s, Taha's popularly named the Republican Brotherhood, after his political party, attracted a few thousand followers from all parts of Sudan. The foundation of Ustaz Mahmoud's teachings was the discipline of Tariq Muhammad, the path of the prophet. These teachings presented a challenging design for life that embraced gender equality and social justice against the backdrop of an increasingly Islamist-oriented Sudan. Taha published his book, The Second Message of Islam, Arasala Tanim in Islam. Uh, it was translated in 1987, in the same year as Sayyid Qut's milestones. <clears throat> That modernist progressive Islamic thinking could emerge from Sudan, a black African country dismissed by Orientalists such as Trimingham as existing on the Islamic fringe, despite Sudan's proximity across the Red Sea from Mecca, continues to be the dominant mode by which Western scholars of Islam and Rujal al-Din thinkers of the Muslim world itself consider the differentiation of Muslim practice in Sudan. This is an important reason for the ideas of the Republican Brotherhood to be considered in a more global context. Um, let me speed things up. And um, in, the, in the 1980s, at the height of the Brotherhood's membership, the Republicans confronted Sudan President Jafar Namiri's imposition of his version of Islamic law with publications and street corner lectures. The Republicans had been banned by the Sudan government from the broadcast airwaves earlier. Uh, through small, peaceful protests in the, streets of, in the streets, the Republicans' point was that Islamic law would only be oppressive to the millions of non-Muslims in the country and to women. Their credo was the Quranic verse from Surat al-Baqarah, La ikra fil din, no compulsion in religion. The result of this resistance was the 1984 arrest, 1985 trial, and public execution <clears throat> of Taha on trumped up charges of apostasy. Um, the best known um, Republican innovation imported from the, the, the brothers had been traveling abroad, and then um, there were a few who had who'd spent significant time in the West prior to Ustaz Mahmoud's execution. <coughs> and the best known Republican innovation imported from one brother's trip abroad that ultimately assisted, assisted Dawa or the propagation of the Republican ideology in Sudan was the member of the public speaking platform, Dr. Abdurrahim, <coughs> Dr. 
Dr. Abdurrahim Areya, who had gone in the 1970s for training in political science in the UK, had admired the speaker's corner they had witnessed in London's Hyde Park. There, anyone could reserve the spot and speak to whatever audience uh, was attracted to the speaker's agenda. The Republicans began using this technique all over urban Sudan to spread awareness of Ustaz Mahmoud's teaching, teachings, although the Republican intent in presenting a platform was more about developing the inner awareness of the speaker, brother or sister, over the goal of recruiting new Republicans. They lived and expressed devotion to God <coughs> rather than slavish adherence to Sharia. Such issues were expressed and explored in the member, which became particularly popular both on university campuses and daily under a large Aradeb tamarind tree in downtown Khartoum. During Numeri's crackdown on the Republicans in 1983-84, Republican brothers and sisters were actually arrested while in the act of presenting these platforms in the Khartoum area. Um, the, the Republican Brotherhood never had a detailed plan to propagate Mahmoud Mahmataha's message abroad, but happenstance and words of Ustaz Mahmoud assisted in that process. No one assumed the mantle of leadership following Ustaz Mahmoud's execution. He did not have a Khalifa. So the continuation of the movement became a pers personal action on the part of individual Republican brothers and sisters its collective power uh, had to be read from this <coughs> aggregate. Um, Taha had written in, the, in his book, The Second Message of Islam, in view of the consistent failure of human ideology to find the proper balance between the interests of the individual and those of society, we propose an alternative ideology, namely Islam. And this is not the partisan dogmatic call to Islam as a religion opposed to other religions, it is not even a religion as opposed to secular thinking. Our conception of Islam embraces other religions and secular socio-political theories in that it accepts and provides for the realization of the entire body of religions and human thinking. Taha and his followers spoke of, of this message as a universal one, so living it outside of Sudan could be seen as part of its natural progress. However, the socio-political, socio-economic circumstances which led Republicans abroad were not necessarily spiritual in nature. There were firings and harassment at work for some under um, the Bashir and Gaz regime, which um, came to power in a coup in 1989. And there were opportunities abroad that pulled Republicans to seek uh, employment elsewhere. The crushing devastation of Ustaz Mahmoud's execution was also in the minds of many as they packed to leave Sudan, the eternal home of the Republican ideology and the embedded nostalgia of the perfection of the land and its people. So um, Republicans started to take advantage of the opportunities in um, wealthier uh, Arabic-speaking countries, which was a common phenomenon across um, the Middle East, the Arab world, um, obviously the the poor Arab, Arabic in countries, Morocco's and um, the Palestines and Egypt's and so forth, um, send labor to the, <clears throat> the Gulf um, states in particular. So uh, let me talk about the situation of the Republican brothers and sisters in two countries, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, to give a sense of the mobility of the <coughs> Republican ideology in the Arab world. And then I'll conclude with the uh, Republicans' American experience, uh, which probably sounds ironic. Anyway, um, in Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, Republican brothers and sisters have found a wide variety of employment in the Gulf state of Qatar. Positions held by Republicans in this small, wealthy country include physicians, psychiatrists, pharmacists, university lecturers, highway engineers, service and Qatar ministries. The Udaid military base outside Doha is also the largest U.S. military outpost in the Middle East, housing some 11,000 U.S. soldiers. Over the years, 
of its existence, this base has employed several Republicans in key translator positions through US contractors. The position of military translator <coughs> also requires US citizenship or security screening. So this indicates, it indicates that many Gata Republicans are in that country through steppe migration. Earlier on, in most cases, towards the beginning of Omar al-Bashir's regime in Khartoum, these Republicans had moved to the US primarily for graduate degrees and or seeking political asylum and became US citizens. While US citizenship is part of the security requirement for working on the military base, it also means that Sudanese employed in Qatar and other Gulf states may receive higher salaries than, say, African, um, African nationals seeking jobs <coughs> in the Gulf. Western qualifications earn higher salaries in the Gulf. In the UAE, Republicans are employed in similar positions as Qatar with the additional opportunities such as fire prevention, legal advisors, accountants, and the retail sector. There's also a smaller US military facility in Abu Dhabi where some Republicans are employed as translators under similar circumstances as the base in Qatar. I would estimate there are approximately 25 Republicans, Republican families <coughs> in, in Qatar and about 40 families across UAE. That the Republicans working in the Gulf states, and there are some in Oman, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia, as well as a few formerly employed as translators for US military during the US-led invasions of Kuwait and Iraq, tolerate the restrictions placed on them under these Salafist regimes, and both is both ironic and indicative of the difficult political economy at home. Republicans in Qatar and UAE must be very discreet about their religious orientation, but they do meet amongst themselves frequently. They are an extended family, after all. And any Republican gathering at the home of one of their number, or a picnic at some pleasant spot, will be just for Republicans. It may include the singing of their hymns, Gasside, which are major features of the Republican events at home, as well as in the post Ustaz Mahmoud era. The situation is made easier by the fact that the Arab societies of the Gulf are closed with few to no invitations made to outsiders to visit their homes. A colleague from work may invite one to a wedding nikah or a hotel, uh, at a hotel or some other neutral location, but these are male-only events which do not include prayer beyond the reading of the Fatha. The Republicans in the Gulf live comfortable if modest <coughs> lives <clears throat> in cities where the emphasis uh, in popular image is on living over-the-top lux lives. Saving some money to send home remittances, of course, and for the most part, filling their religious obligations in a strange land is their focus. But in guarded private conversation, Republicans will readily describe the Salafist re regime under which they live and work and its attendant contradictions the opulent lifestyles making any religious um, proclamation by governments or individuals not <coughs> credible. They will also describe the hypocr hypocritical denouncements of Islamic terrorist attacks in the West made by people in the Gulf states who at the same time make financial contributions to such cells. In conversation with Republicans, no Gulf person will be identified necessarily as participating in this kind of activity, and lowered voices or declarations that <clears throat> this impression or knowledge of mine is just between us also characterizes these discussions. The Republicans residing as guests in these Muslim Gulf states recognize that their hosts find their views of Islam essentially heretical, and the feeling is mutual at best. In Sudan, um, pause. Uh, while, while re Republicans acknowledge that much of Mahmoud Mahmoud's thinking was heavily influenced by Sufi masters of the past, such as Nablusi, Abdul Ghadar Jailani, or Ibn Arabi, and the words of those thinkers feature centrally in the Republican Ghassaid, they do not necessarily think of themselves as a Sufi order. Their view has been that the Sufis, such a very prominent aspect of Sudanese Islam, had lost their way with the Sufi emphasis on ritual and ritualistic obeisance to one sheikh. 
Republicans like to say that conventional Sufi practice is largely, uh, largely zikr bedun fikr, or remembering, remembering God without, without thinking about it. <laughs> but, but, in that, um, but in that, it is, a cha it is challenging for outsiders to sort out the difference between them and Sudan's mainstream Sufis, it does give them pause when they hear denouncements of Sufis by, their gov by the governments under which they live, with an emphasis on condemning shirik from pulpits and ministries in those countries. Criticism of Tasawuf is to be expected in these nations where religious tolerance is not respected or observed. Republicans in both Qatar and UAE have their children with them in many cases. It is an, it's expensive to educate them, and that the preference is for international or English medium schools, where Dean does not have a big role, role in the curriculum. <clears throat> Republicans in Dubai, uh, the largest city in the UAE, complain of the racism they experience in the country and other types of discrimination. Sudanese and other non-nationals are referred to as Mukayim, residents, as opposed to Mwatan, citizen. And there is an attendant expectation that Mwatan have of Mukayim that, that the latter move out of the way when the Mwatan passes. But of course, this pales against the knowledge that they are living in a country whose government cooperated with the regime in power in Sudan that has so oppressed, oppressed them for their dedication to Ustaz Mahmoud's teachings. Conser conversations often turn uh, to the subject of immigrating to Canada a nation understood to be a land which respects freedom of expression and religion and which is still encouraging immigration. Turning to the um, USA experience. And looking at the movement of Republican brothers and sisters around the world, the followers of Mahmoud Muhammad Taha in the United States represent something of an enigma. American society offers both abundant obstacles and abundant opportunities to, to the Republican with intentions of engaging in the Islamic imperatives of proselytizing, extending the faith in new directions. The opportunities, of course, lie in the openness of American society to new ideas about religion and the eagerness of many Americans to at least hear about alternative ways to approach the divine. And the American Constitution and the rule of law are supposed to guarantee freedom to engage in such proselytizing. On the other hand, the increasing secularity of America, combined with ever-present Islamophobia, particularly since 9-11, may dampen the enthusiasm for launching any kind of attempt to introduce Mahmoud's uh, apparently obscure message in the USA. Nevertheless, over the years of the Republican presence in the US, there have been a variety of efforts to at least raise awareness of the Taha message usually presented in the context of not correcting Western misconceptions about Islam, but of presenting the Republican ideology as a standalone truth about what the Quran and Prophet Muhammad explained to humanity in the seventh century. A moderate, non-extremist interpretation of Islam is central to re Republican understanding. Republicans also experience the tension in the US of the current atmosphere around the immigration issue that dominates headlines and the political discourse. Many of them sought asylum in the United States, particularly since Bashir's coup in 1989, a few converted student visas into permanent residents. A Washington, D.C.-based attorney developed a specialty in getting Republicans through the asylum application process, pro, pro, process who is still invited to their social occasions. Uh, there was a period when many non-Republican Sudanese claimed to be followers of Mahmoud Mamataha in order to apply for asylum um, and sought members from uh, affidavits from members of Ustaz Mahmoud's family and even me to support such claims. Poverty has also been an obstacle for, fill, for, fill, for fulfilling lives in the United States where the expense of living and the financial demands from home mean that some have need, needed to delay further training or higher education in order to send money home, which in turn impedes the advancement in the US. Republicans have started the US lives on food stamps or in subsidized uh, Section 8 housing. 
with uh, limited financial resources and no formal infrastructure for the movement in the United States, opportunities for disseminating the Republican message are generally small in scale. Personal encounters with work colleagues, uh, neighbors, friends are the mode, sometimes accompanied by the offer of one of the Republican books in English. The format may be the invitation or lure to try Sudanese food. Love that fool with one's family or an invitation from one Republican to join him or her at a Republican picnic, wedding, etc. in the area. Again, in every instance, the emphasis is on extending the Republican individual's confidence and commuting, communicating the ideology over planning for new membership. Every Republican in, living in the U.S. has encountered um, an exuberant American interested in what they have been <coughs> told about Taha's liberal approach to Islam. None have actually embraced Islam as a result of these encounters, to my knowledge. Mm. And the friendly American attitude is one generally as Republican brother and Emory University law professor Abdullah and Naim interpreted it to me of that Quote, that Republican ideology sounds like a good thing for you Muslims to observe, but is not deeply appealing to me personally. In locations with greater resources, such as university towns in the U.S., like Iowa City, Iowa, or Athens, Ohio, larger Republican-themed events may be staged and built around the visit of a key member of the organization from Sudan or from another part of the U.S., this type of event may also take place in an urban center like Dallas, Texas, or the Washington, D.C. area, where there may be a larger Sudanese jalia and a larger number, number of Republicans in the community. <clears throat> Some of these large-scale events in the U.S. have had success in recruiting new Republicans, particularly young women who um, have come, young Sudanese women who've come to the U.S. with prior little knowledge of Taha's ideas. The point of these public events is to, one, remind people, particularly other Sudanese, that the Republican Brotherhood is still around and ready to convey the ideas of Mahmoud Mamata for a peaceful democratic Sudan, and two, to bring the attention of the general public um, to Sudan, which many feel is an obscure place in the US context. Finally, public speaking, public presentations, are very much part of the DNA of the Republican Brotherhood's operations. Such activity was shut down in Sudan following uh, Daha's execution and revived to a limited extent in the U.S. diaspora. The same applies to other Western countries where Republicans are found on a smaller scale, the U.K. or Canada in particular. The January 18th anniversary of Ustaz Mahmoud's execution provides an important setting for annual gatherings in the U.S., and for more discreet at-home observations um, in the Gulf. Um, talk briefly about children. Uh, discipline is a core Republican value, both in the Arabic sense of tarbiyah, training, and in the sense of providing the atmosphere for one's children to learn right from wrong. Immigrant parents' limited experience of the mores of American culture or that their children learn those more as faster than they do, results in many difficult challenges for these families. <clears throat> Some of the Republican offspring um, have admitted to me about drug and alcohol use and premarital sex, although their parents have not discussed uh, this behavior with me. The children and their parents are also dealing with identity issues in the US as they never had to in Sudan particularly around the issue of being black. A young Republican woman who came to study with me at my university told me, we come here, Steve, and learn for the first time that we are African, which further complicates um, adjustment issues. The discovery of Africa comes from exposure to the cosmopolitan space in the American university, not to mention the African immigrant community of many, many nationals of other African countries. Finding space to focus on the spiritual in such contexts has much resonance with other African Muslim immigrant groups in the U.S., such as the Somalis, whose large communities in the U.S. are frequently dealing with these difficult issues 
across generations. However, the Republicans in the US and in the Gulf are guarded about their interactions about, with other Muslims, a characteristic of their lives um, in the Sudan as well. Um, practice and perfection of the Republican <coughs> ideology in Sudan and its diaspora varies primarily in its intensity. In the years following the execution of Mahmoud Mamataha, the Republicans have looked inwards for answers to their spiritual questions. And now political questions surface as well as every Sudanese remains glued to their TV screens uh. watching their new Medinia civil civilian government unfold. Among the Republicans, we witness an interesting dynamic of leadership in which you lead me as I lead you and virtually everyone steps up to do what is needed to be done. The dramatic changes uh, of this year have caused some in the jali of Republicans abroad to imagine going home to continue their wait for what is yet to come and the land that uh, gave rise to their spiritual constitution. What remains clear after years of listening to Republicans abroad is that exposure to other Islams in their travels has not distracted them from the precision of thought they learned from Mahmoud Muhammad Taha. Either this or the flood Imahada al Taufan was the heading of the flyer they distributed on the streets of Khartoum that led to Ustaz Mahmoud's execution. Preserving the republicanness of their children is a priority, and it seems, at least on the surface, to be a successful process. An undergraduate at a US college who grew up in a large Republican family told me, I cannot separate my identity as Sudanese from my identity as Jamhuri. Um, Arabic for Republican. It's like I'm only Sudanese through the Jamhuri lens. Separating the social aspects of that identity from the spiritual would be a murkier task. But we're, what remains fundamentally clear is that the Republican Brotherhood remains an important example of a moderate Muslim manazma dedicated to peace. Thank you. A lot of thought for discussion, so the floor is open if you have questions and comments. Yes, uh, Professor, and then uh, uh, Dr. Felicita. Uh, thank you very much to the three panelists. It's really fascinating. Uh, I have, um, I will limit my question to the last speaker, uh, Professor Howard. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I learned so much, and I am happy we contributed to the uh, to push you to write in this for this conference. So, <laughs> Great, <laughs> because you were, yeah, absolutely, you told me earlier that you needed that push. <laughs> so, ex, ex, extraordinary presentation. But I have one question about one particular person from the uh, Republicans. This one? Yes. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. But he's also, uh, uh, this is Professor Abdullahi Naim. You quoted him briefly as though he was not really part of the Republican Brotherhood, even though we know that he contributed hugely to the, uh, um, I mean, awareness about this cause. In the West. In the West when he moved. And then that led him to become later on one of the most influential intellectuals who advocate for, including his books and his scholarship, advocate for reconciliation, so to speak, between Sharia and democracy. And he, he rose to fame about this, and we can still, I, uh, I mean, I, uh, I showed my student his debate with Tariq Ramadan, so he's pretty much at the heart of the ongoing conversations about secularism, Sharia, etc. Of course, he didn't agree with Ramadan. But the point is, he contributed. To what extent do you consider him as an object of study in your, uh, um, in your, uh, your um, project of following uh, the Western uh, path of the Muslim brothers, considering that you were really the Republican, oh sorry, the Republican brothers, 
considering your, your book uh, is very unique in that regard. You were there and you were following them and you, it's based really on real field work. So my question is that, what is the role of Abd, um, Abdullah Naim and how can you explain that he ended up being that spoke person for um, secular Islam? Huh. Well, um, it's, it, that's a long story, um, <laughs> of course. Make it short. Uh, Abdullah Naim is uh, certainly, a, he, he's my teacher too. And um, since uh, my running around um, looking for a cool place to sit in the heat in, at the University of Khartoum in the, the early 80s, I would hide in his office. I think, I think you need a mic. Oh, do I? Okay, there's one here. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, he has been in the West for a long, long time. Um, before Mahmoud's execution, he did his graduate work in the UK, and that was um, like in the late 70s. So he's been dealing with the West um, for a long time. He, he served as, when my own um, dissertation advisor, David Wiley, came to Sudan in the early 80s. Abdullah was the translator between him and Mahmoud Mahmoudaha. And so he's, he's been a between kind of guy for a very, very, very long time. And um, he certainly gets um, talked about in this new book I'm working on. But um, there, are, there are many uh, Jamhurin in the US and, and Abdullah is such a special case. And he's also, let me say, um, I love him dearly, but he's sort of taken himself out of the community in many ways, too. Um, in fact, uh, the Atlanta community of Republicans consists of him and his nuclear family, pretty much, <laughs> and his in-laws and so forth. Um, so it hasn't attracted, even though it's nice weather for somebody from Sudan. Um, it hasn't, he hasn't built up much of a community there. Um, and uh, his, and, and quite frankly, to answer your specific question, his uh, talking about secular Islam um, has made him a bit of anathema uh, in the community. He's, and, and I'm ashamed to talk about this, but he has received um, very nasty um, reactions from some, I'll particularly say older members of the community who have um, chewed him out over this in, in public and online. And it's been, it's been very hurtful, too. And I think that's part of the reason why he's kind of retreated as well, that he doesn't need this, this stuff. You know, he doesn't have to um, listen to it. He has a, uh, a good job in Atlanta, although I think he's moving towards retirement. He's in his mid-70s. Um, so uh, does that answer your question? OK. okay I mean, we could talk about it. Thank you. And thanks to all the panelists for a great panel. My question is for Ria. Um, 10, 12 years ago, I found myself looking at pretty much what you are looking at in the East African, specifically Tanzanian context, mm -hmm. at the time the topic, the issue was very, very urgent before ARVs became available. And pretty much everything you said, I think, resonated with what I observed. Um, and as concerns specifically the extremely problematic role of policy made in the UK in this context, I'd, want first of all to highlight that just a couple of days ago, The Guardian reported that a so-called lifestyle website for Muslims in the UK turned out to be funded mm. by the interior. It had links to prevent, mm. basically, which immediately undermined its mm. uh, legitimacy for its target audience. So this is very much a live <coughs> ongoing problem. That said, one thing I found interesting in the East African context is that there seemed to be, well, DFID's instrumental attitude to religion mm -hmm. extended, in a sense, to all religions. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they had mm -hmm. um, 
specific problems with Islam, but they sometimes had quite similar problems with African-initiated forms of Christianity. Mm. Um, and on the other hand, it also seemed to be the case that at times you actually saw a convergence between Roman Catholics with their strong anti-condom stance, mm. um, other, let's just say, socially conservative forms of Christianity, and Muslims critical of the ABC mm. formula. Um, it was quite ironic because in many ways at the time, relations between Muslims and Christians in Tanzania were poor. But on this one issue, th there seemed to be some sort of cross-religious community, uh, at least momentarily. Have you seen anything like that in South Africa as well? Of, of links between, like, in terms of... Any in, kind of social? No, no, in in terms of um, criticism of the ABC formula from religious, from Christian mm -hmm. as well as Muslim sides and attempts to talk across the religious divide about these shared concerns. From, from what I saw around it, I, I didn't see, I, I saw more of Abu Bakr's attitude of, we know we have to say these things, but they don't actually speak to conditions on the ground. So I was, I was, ex I was I didn't actually engage with any other kinds of religious NGOs in South Africa, so I don't know how they negotiated that. But I guess what seemed significant to me, you know, when I said that different members of Islamic Relief, everyone we spoke to, had a different valence of what Islamic Relief does on HIV and AIDS. So for you know one of uh, another staff member. They, you know, their sister worked for UNAIDS, and so that kind of policy element seemed. When we asked her what Islamic Relief does, like that was that was the vein. Well, we do trainings, and we're. Da -da -da. Whereas what seemed significant to me was Abu Bakr was much more kind of based in community and and responding, and not so much interested on a on a policy level. So I guess that's the distinction I'm trying to make. Like those who. Um, weren't so interested in policy, we're sort of like, okay, ABC sort of comes from here, but it doesn't actually speak to, so. Okay, we have, yes, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Bach, if you don't mind. I'm very intrigued by the phenomenon of West African Muslims moving, coming to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. My question is this, was it all in connection with the Hajj or did any West African Muslims migrate and move to Jerusalem during Khalilia Dales for other reasons or was it always they went to Hajj and on the way back settled in Jerusalem? That's my question. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think this was the part that I skipped on my, uh, <laughs> my presentation and uh, of course mostly it was a combination between uh, the new opportunity of the of the colonial era, uh, for example, the um, construction of r railroads uh, and uh, other construction. Some of them uh, also arrived with the general Allen B. forces uh, fighting the Osman uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, but there was some kind of combination be be because uh, they combined the uh, career aspiration, if you may call it, they were usually very young, uh, with the with the uh, with the Hajj, they performed the Hajj, and after they arrived to Jerusalem, and it was also part of the Hajj circuit, but also uh, they have a vocational opportunity there and they have community that they could uh, live there. So it's primarily the it's some kind of combination. I think it's primarily uh, the, the new opportunity of the colonial area and the better uh, mobility of the... Just one real quick. I've never been to the um, community in Jerusalem. I didn't even know it was there, so I'm going to go visit it in the Philippines. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you I can... Uh, Mariam, I can take one last question. I'm sorry. Maybe we'll continue at lunch. Uh, for if you have uh, other comments or questions. Maria. Thank you so much for um, Dr. Irit for um, 
your wonderful um, enlightenment about the African community. I just wanted to show you a picture of me with Yasser. This was a uh, few years ago. I don't know if you can see it. I'll come a little closer. Um, I have another one. Let me just come a little closer. I can't hold this and walk with my crutch at the same time. Oh, okay, so please uh, join me to thank the panelists.